In the beginning, God created relationships between God and angels, God and man, and between all of us. Through the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we are all interconnected. Come join Pastor Penny Schultz and Kristen Scharnberg as scholars, counselors, travelers through the Holy Land, and warriors in Christ, while they explore the fascinating, the difficult, the obscurities, the oddities, and the hope of God's Holy Word. They will discuss what those scriptures mean to us and how living in the Spirit changes everything. Hello, and welcome to Live Live Life in the Spirit. Spirit. We are your hosts. I am Kristen Scharenberg. And I'm Pastor Penny Schultz. We are so glad you took time out of your busy day to join us for some joy, some inspiration, and definitely some interesting, intriguing, out-of-the-box thinking. You can go back and watch or listen to our previous podcast podcasts on our YouTube channel or the various podcast feeds like iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many others. You can also check out our website at livelifeinthespirit.com. You can click on the tab of your choice, and that will take you directly to either the podcast, the podcast, or our blogs. Be sure to catch up on our inspirational blogs while you're there, and don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on our newest content. This is the place where we're daring enough to tackle the tough issues that we face on a daily basis, ranging from the spiritual to the supernatural. We will dig in into the angelic realm, the little gods of this world, the Nephilim, the giants, dinosaurs, Bigfoot, UFOs, and aliens. As the late, great Dr. Michael Heiser says, if it's weird and in the Bible, you better pay attention, because it's in there for a reason. So where do we go for answers, and what does the Bible have to say? You know, all this is going to be discussed from a biblical, not a worldly perspective. Because once you know, you can't unknow. So before we dive in, let's take just a moment to introduce ourselves. So who is Kristen? Well, she's been working in the mental health field for 15 years. She's had her work cut out for herself ever since she met me. (laughs) And she is definitely not the one you want to take to a don't laugh situation. I've heard that more than once just this week. So who's Penny? She started out in the medical field and then God moved her into the ministry over 24 years ago. I know she doesn't look old enough to have been in ministry for that long. I was five when I started. Oh, that that makes sense. She's been shepherding the lost ever since and she's definitely had her work cut out for her since she met me. We have done some pretty exciting things and we have walked in the most amazing places. Wearing these shirts. It's true. (laughs) It seems fitting for today's topic. It does. Get used to different. I wish that we could take some credit for coming up with the saying, but it comes from the Chosen series. That pretty much sums up both of us (laughs) in our show. What we discuss on this platform is definitely different from what you will hear on most Sunday mornings. True. So we are super excited today. One of our fellow adventurers in Israel has agreed to come on our show, Philip Fayetteel of Oklahoma. He's been an educator for 18 years, teaching science in the public school system, and he also helped develop curriculum for the homeschool system. He has a BS in journalism and a master's in communication. Philip has debated and researched creation, evolution, and intelligent design theories. He has a passion for the obscure as well, and is a perfect guest for today's topic, dinosaurs and where are they in the Bible. Well, you know, to give a little background to this before we jump right in with Philip, it was in the 1820s when Gideon Mantell, an English doctor, found some unusual teeth and bones in a quarry. Now, Dr. Mantell realized that there was something different about these animal remains. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. And he believed that he had found an entirely new group of reptiles. By 1841, about nine types of these different reptiles had been uncovered, including two called Megalothaurus and Iguanodon. Hmm. Well, it's at this time that the famous British science, Dr. Richard Owen, coined the name Dinosauria, meaning terrible terrible lizard. For this is what the huge bones made him think of. Makes sense. And so with that, we're going to jump right in and we are going to hook up with uh, Philip as he is coming to us on Zoom. That's right. That's what that BS degree is for. I also had, got third place. On our show. 
Yeah, I got third place in the math contest in fifth grade, so just wanted to sneak that in there. I'm I'm glad you added that. We don't want to not mention such accolades. <laughs> you know what? I don't want to oversell myself, but you know. You don't want to undersell either. I'm the never guilty of that. So <laughs> Philip has been hosting the Zoom meetings that we've had after Israel. And we have people from all around the world that actually went on that trip. And we've been into some really, really good conversations since then. That trip focused on archaeology and the fallen realm and the places around Israel and how that all worked in. And we got into the whole creation evolution discussion and dinosaurs. And the cool thing is, you know, we talk about the oddities of of the Bible and the obscurities. And right now we're looking at uh, how we found things that now don't make sense. sense with what we've always known. Another oddity, but it's really not anti-scriptural. Not at all. It really it fits better. Fits, it fits much better. And Philip has quite a bit of information and I don't want to say uh, expertise <laughs> on digging in all this. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the dinosaurs and how do they fit into Genesis? Right. How do they fit into the creation story? And really, when did they exist? And what have we learned since then that may blow your minds? That's right. So with that, we'd like to introduce you to Philip Benstall. <laughs> Well, hello, uh, founding co-members of the what, LMS Society. I'll let you explain that one. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So you want me to just like jump into. Yeah. Like, di So dinosaurs in the Bible. So um, so I taught uh, science for of those 18 years. I saw, taught science, biology, STEM science for about eight, eight years. And um, so there's an, always this interesting idea when you get to dinosaurs in the Bible, because people are always like, where are dinosaurs in the Bible? So I looked it up because, you know, I'm trying to trying to be a good little researcher here. And um, here is what I found about dinosaurs in the Bible. You guys ready for this? This is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, uh, they're not in the Bible. It, <laughs> dinosaur. I did a search. Comprehend. I mean, I it was it was like eight characters. I had to type it all in there and spell it right. And I got no results for dinosaurs. So. That's kind of the end of the discussion as far as like most academics, except for the problem is dinosaur, that that term uh, didn't, uh, wasn't introduced until 1842 by uh, Sir Richard yeah, Owen mm -hmm. uh, in England. And he introduced the term dinosaur, which means a an, an, uh, terrible lizard. Right? Ah, yeah. um, so, but it's not in the Bible. Dinosaur is not in the Bible. However... <laughs> Uh, there are some other words that do show up in the Bible. So, um, so there, here's dinosaur. Just want full disclosure: dinosaur is not uh, in the Bible. But really, not even in the King James. <laughs> no, no, not even the King James. But Richard Owens uh, introduced in 1842. All right. But if you look at some different words, uh, they do turn up in the Bible, such as tanin. Uh, so tanin is Hebrew. And you can kind of look here. You got to see serpent, dragon, sea monster. All right. And uh, there's some different. So it's interpreted different ways depending on the context. Sometimes serpent, sometimes sea monster, so forth. Um, but so tanin is something to look up. So tanin is in the Bible, but it can mean different things. You also have some other interesting words like Leviathan. And we actually talked about that on Gilgal Raphaim and some of the other places we went, the chaos monster and so forth. But Leviathan shows up six times, as you can see here. And um, in Job, of course, a couple of times, Psalms, Isaiah. Uh, and then you also have in the New Testament, you have Dracon, right, where we get the word dragon. And that turns up 13 times, a lot in Revelation. You see it a lot in Revelation. So um, so basically, it, dinosaur is not in the Bible, but the Bible does talk about dragons, Leviathan, serpents. It talks about uh, there's bohemoths. Uh, it does talk about some creatures that we don't have. have anyway, um, yeah. So that's kind of the, the introduction. Now I can throw some of the evidence at you. Do you any questions so far? Bye -bye. Well, that's pretty much what, um, yeah, when people say, well, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible, that's exactly it. Because the term didn't come about until 1842. Creation was day one. <laughs> the Bible came out. Yeah. Moses <laughs> started writing it way back when. Right. Uh, printing press. A lot of things changed the printing press, but even that wasn't out then at that point. So it wouldn't even be in the King James Bible either. 
but that doesn't mean we know that these things existed because archaeologists have dug up all the fossils, paleontologists. I mean, we've seen all the bones. We had the bones. So they had to come from somewhere. We've been told throughout all of our years in school, ever since we were little, that these animals are millions and millions of years old. And they all died in the Ice Age before man was here. Uh, but now we're finding out that that may not be exactly true. So right. What kind of evidence have, have you uncovered or has, has been uncovered to support that? Difference? Yeah, so... I do have a BS degree in journalism, but I did not come up with what I'm presenting to you just to give full credit. There's been some creationists, uh, Ken Hovine, uh, Ken Ham, uh, Discovery Institute Creation Research. So I just want to give, you know, because I'm just taking other people's stuff. So, uh, but I, I do enjoy kind of going over this. So, okay. So, yeah. So some of the things that they've come up with that are pretty interesting idea. Now, um, this idea of could dinosaurs and dragons be the same thing? Right. And um, that was the that's what opened up the actually the all the rabbit hole and the red pill and all this for me started about 2011 when I was teaching. And I was like, hey, I like dragons. And I like dinosaurs. And then somebody is, well, what if they're the same thing? And um so that got me thinking, and of course, these, there's some number of great books on that. So I, I have, um, and I actually have toys. I, I love toys. <laughs> I love it too much. But the toys are interesting because toys, like here's two uh, toys from China, made in China, of course. And one is a T-Rex and one is a dragon. Which They're one's which? Thing. They're the same old, basically. Yeah, and and the thing, and you see this with toys. If you if you a lot of toys, the Chinese kind of have are much more open to dragons and dinosaurs being the same thing. So a lot of their toys, they'll use the same basic body type when they build the toy, but they'll just paint it different. Sure. Uh, and that goes back to what do we find in the ground? Like you mentioned, what do we find in the ground? We find plastic toys from made in China. No, I'm sorry, we find fossils. <laughs> we find fossils. This is not a fossil. This is a fossil. Okay, but we find fossils. And then we extrapolate and we put skin on them. We put, we kind of give them characteristics that we can't know from the, the fossil itself, right. right? So the fossil is limited. It gives structural things. But even fossils, most fossils, you don't find fossils like this very often where the whole thing is laid out mm -hmm. um, in a nice, you know, smooth pattern, right? Easy most to, fossils right. Are, are jumbled. There's one bone here, a bone here. There's a lot of stories of people putting the fossil together wrong <laughs> and, and making the neck too long or too short or putting the head of one dinosaur on the fossil of another. Yeah, it, I was going to say, there are multiple fossils in the same mm -hmm. bone pile. Right. And you, like in Germany, there's a very famous dinosaur graveyard in Germany where hundreds of these dinosaurs died and were buried all together, which supports this idea of a global flood. Um but they're all buried together. And so, yeah, they're, they're, it, it's a puzzle and they don't always get it right. Uh, so the, the kind of the thing that got me going down this route hole is, is what if dinosaurs and dragons are the same thing? And then there's, and so I present to my students and we would talk about it. And of course the two big things were, well, what, what, let me ask you two ladies, what's the difference between a dragon and a dinosaur? I, I, just give me one piece of evidence that proves that they're not the same. We can throw it away. The whole theory we can throw out the window. No, What's the difference? Dragons breathe fire, and that's mentioned in the Bible too. <laughs> so dragons breathe fire. Anything else dragons do is that uh, dinosaurs can't? Why? Well, I, I guess know. we don't know. Yeah. Why or not? No. It, right. So you have you have uh, <laughs> you have you have uh, uh, dinosaurs or uh, dragons. Sorry, dragons can fly, right? And uh, at least it's in the the Wyren and the different in mythologies and and stories of dragons, they can fly, and we know that. Dinosaurs can't fly, so pterodactyl looks just like. Oh wait, yeah, yeah. So there were dinosaurs that could fly. That's true. And there were actually in in uh, dragon mythology, um, there are there are stories of dragons that can't fly. So like the the Chinese dragon does not have any wings, right? So there are different kinds of dragon types. There's different stories, different legends of different dra dragons. But the idea that dra dragons can fly and dinosaurs can't, well, we do actually have uh, dinosaurs that can fly. And then uh, breathing fire is an interesting one, Penny, because how do we know that dinosaurs couldn't breathe fire? We don't. 
Yeah. All we what do we have? What do we have left? Bones. 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 <laughs> yeah. Just bones. So, bones number there. If if a, a civilization a million years from now found all of our bones and they look at our skull, would they have looking at the human skull, would they have been able to say, Hey, that person that 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 fossil created movies and the internet and, and T V and all this art and you didn't tell what color from yeah. just bones. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the the soft tissue, which we don't have, well, sort of, okay. The soft tissue, oh, yeah, yeah. the soft tissue, we don't have a lot of it. Um, there, there is some interesting T-Rex soft tissue, but um, so we're guessing, we're guessing. But the, um, here's another uh, little screenshot here. Let's see where, uh, another thing I pointed out with the electric eel. If we found, if we found a fossil of an electric eel, would we know from the fossil that it could produce electricity? Electricity? No, we wouldn't. Mm -mm. Yeah, because it, it, that's part of the soft tissue of the electric eel. Um, there's also a creature called the bombardier beetle, and the, my, my students love this one. <laughs> my kids as well because it sprays acid out its its butt, and so <laughs> teenagers love that. So uh, it sprayed acid out its backside, and it burns up ants. It can literally burn ants. Now it's not super big. But for its size, it's a it's a it's a Back monster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that in prehistoric size, <laughs> not be good. That would almost be like fire breathing. That, <laughs> they just have the end wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then you get gases. I mean, with with gases again, not every dragon could breathe fire. In in a lot of legends, they don't breathe fire. And in some legends, they do, but uh, we we assume all dragons breathe fire. Um, and in movies, we kind of get that. And I asked, actually, I would ask my students, okay, how do we understand dragons? And they would movies and they books, maybe legends, right? But of course, the movies and the books come from the legends. Uh, but uh, the fantastic fire breathing dragon is really cool. That makes for good movies. But there's a lot of other dragons, a lot different um, throughout the world. Okay, so, oh, the dating. So, uh, some of the big objections to uh, dragons and dinosaurs being the same thing, um, besides the flying, um, the uh, the Komodo dragon, this is interesting. The Komodo dragon, uh, I didn't don't have a picture of that, but you can throw one up later if you want. Uh, the Komodo dragon is an actual lizard that we can go visit. They actually have it in uh, zoos nowadays. And and in on the island of Komodo in Indonesia, um, it has been known to kill people from time to time, not super common. But one of the ways it kills its predator, the, the or the prey, the the deer, is it bites them, and then it withdraws. And it has so much bacteria, it has so much junk in its mouth, the Komodo dragon, that the bite itself will introduce that bacteria into the the prey, and the prey will die basically from po blood poisoning. <laughs> will get sepsis oh and die. Um, and so again, that's not something you would know from a fossil, but the Komodo right. dragon will ba basically, um, it doesn't have a venom, but it will basically it's inject a dirty mouth. Yeah, a dirty mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so again, these are not things we're going to see in soft, uh, in uh, the fossil. All right? right. Uh, so the argument is what if dragons and dinosaurs are looking at the same thing, but from different directions, dinosaurs are looking at the fossils. Um, and then dragons are looking at the legends, but we're looking at the same creature uh, or group of creatures. It's not mm -hmm. just one, but a group of creatures. Um, so this gets into dating. Um, so I used to joke, and it's not really a joke anymore, but I, I like to date rocks. Um, and um, that sounds terribly yeah. boring. <laughs> what? So to date a rock, uh, there's, there's a the problem with dating rocks is that one, they don't talk much, um, but and, and they don't eat much either. And so that's kind of a one way conversation. But anyway, it's a couple of dates. I figured that out. Um, but <laughs> so here, here's a problem with the fossil record. I mean, there, there's two ways to date things when you when you're looking at a rock or strata in the geological column. Uh, you can go on the left side, as you see it, they're relative dating younger to older. That makes sense. The further down you dig, the older the thing's going to be. But how old? Well, this is a problem. And on uh, so dating techniques, they use something called radioactive isotope dating. 
I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole in that one because it's a, it's a long talk. But it's basically um, a way of, of measuring the half-life decay of a radioactive isotope. Right. And by doing the math and crunching the numbers, you can come up with an estimated age, right? So in essence, they're, they're, it, if I remember right from my biology classes a long time ago, mm -hmm. if there's this amount of it left, then they can extrapolate back depending on, based on how much is left by right. watching how quickly it The decays. only problem that I have with that is coming from the radiology background. It's the farther you get, it divides by four. <laughs> And so, I mean, it keeps getting so minute, the distance, the time. The most obvious problems with that is like you're saying, it's, it's, well, the biggest one is you have to assume how much was there in the first place. Right. So you know how much is there now, but you don't know how much was there in the first Started. place. That's the starting assumption. You have to assume a number and, and then you're like, you, do what? How do they pick that number? A hat? I don't know. <laughs> a magic hat? I don't... So they... they uh, Because the conditions of the early Earth, you know, uh, and there, there are some evidence for a much younger Earth that is kind of dismissed. One of them is that we still have helium. Helium is a gas that is being released, and uh, once it releases, goes in the atmosphere, it's very light, and we lose it. So we're actually running out of helium, which is an interesting thing. We yeah. are. If you've gone to Dollar Tree, you cannot get balloons there because there's <laughs> we are yeah. running out of it. So, so, but there is still helium in the ground, and because there's helium in the ground, that tells us the Earth is not as old. So that's something that they just throw away because it's like it doesn't confirm their theory. Um, but so radioactive isotope, you have to assume how much was there in the beginning, and then the other big problem that I have with it is whenever they've tested it on something we know the age of. Uh, for like volcanic, so uh, igneous rocks from volcanoes, they've, they've taken these rocks and they know the volcano, they know when it exploded, let's say a thousand years ago, and they'll take that rock, they'll do some radioactive isotope dating, but they don't tell the people that are that are dating the rock um, where it came from. It's just, hey, test this. And the lab will come back with an age of 20 million years or 30 million years or whatever. Comes back with a way uh, uh, much higher age than they know. They know it's only a thousand years. So whenever you test a rock where you know the age, it always comes back wrong. But you can test rocks you don't know the age and it's 100% accurate. So this is... Yeah. Whatever you're going for. Well, you yeah. know, it, people say, well, when could the dinosaurs have been? Well, we know that in the creation story, you know, after God created the heavens and the earth and the stars and the planets and the st stars, all this stuff, then it says he he created first the fish mm -hmm. and then the birds of the air mm -hmm. and then the animals of the field. But, you know, we're talking, even if you were to say a day is but a thousand years, we don't know. It could be 10,000 years. It could, who knows how, how long it is, but God wasn't in God could have created. <laughs> yes. Those, the first, the dinosaurs first before he started creating the other ones, you were talking about the oxygen content pre flood. We know that it's, you know, we could prove that it's been much bigger oxygen content. And of course those big animals would have needed higher oxygen. They, and while the brontosaurus being tall, higher elevation, smaller nostrils, they needed to be able to breathe oxygen easier. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you uh, give us your opinion on after the flood, if the dinosaurs were still around with man. Yeah, this is a, what you're talking about. See, uh, this is a, a picture from an evolutionary website so you know that's the other um that's one of my problem with christians we and and the and the other side and different sides they always like cherry pick their information so mm -hmm. i like to see what the other side is saying or you know people i disagree with was their point of view so this is from a uh evolutionary uh website uh for kids this is kind of a kid drawn here but there's a certain event right there in the middle where the oxygen level just plummeted. So it was a 30, 33%. Now, how did they figure that? Well, that gets into... Okay, so in an amber, you have these air bubbles. Uh, so amber, if you've seen Jurassic Park, you know, you're an expert on amber now. So um, <laughs> this is a, a mosquito. And uh, they have these air bubbles. And when they test the air bubbles, that's when they find uh, the, this oxygen level. So they can test this. They can say, okay, this. So that's how they got that 
How did they know what amber was pre-flood and post-flood? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, they just know. I mean, don't question science, okay? <laughs> science is always right. <laughs> so, well, just, my guess uh, is they wouldn't say that the flood is whatever that event is. They probably don't label what that event is, but we can say that that's what. The question um, was, um, would the reason for the reduced oxygen content be because all of the big botanical rainforest type vegetation was covered with the flood and died off? That's a great question. That's a great question, Penny. Uh, so here is a, um, yeah, what happened at this, this dotted line down the middle there? Um, again, assuming that radioactive uh, dating techniques are not super accurate and, and there's questions, there's enough questions, there's enough, like I mentioned, the assumptions and the decay rates and testing all those, there's enough to say, okay, something may not be right there. So, but if you do, if you use this timeline and just get rid of the, the millions at the bottom and just be like, okay, something happened here. That could be the flood. So a lot of people think that's flood. What changed in the environment? Well, the earth actually, it did not rain before the flood. All right. So the atmosphere of the earth did change. There's a hint there with the rainbow after the flood because before it just misted mm -hmm. up from the ground. And then after the flood, it rained. So you get the rainbow. Uh, so there's a hint that something happened in the atmosphere. You also have the um, ages of humans, the age of humans before the flood with 30 percent oxygen. They live longer and they may have been protected. There's some very interesting theories like of a ice uh, canopy um, about about 50 miles up an ice canopy yeah, around the about earth. that. So, you know, cause the whole thing was this ice age, you know, what, where did the ice age come from that killed the dinosaurs? If it, goes along with there was no rain so why don't you um mm -hmm. give your what you've heard about with this ice canopy because that was really interesting mm -hmm. i yeah yeah um so again i'm this is a second or third hand I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about this so i'm not an expert but my understanding is that about 50 miles up there is this area that if water is up there it doesn't fall down right it, it stays up there and it gets very cold up there. So it turns into ice, right? So they've seen this with some of the rockets going to outer space. They're, they're, they're releasing stuff as they go and this forms uh, ice. Now then it kind of gravitates toward the poles. But if God created the earth with an ice layer about 50 miles up and let's say two to three feet thick of ice, uh, and in Genesis, it talks about that. He separated the waters from the waters. And it, it says this a couple of times. So this hinting that God did something. And so a, a ice shield, if you will, 50 miles up would, would filter out the ultraviolet radiation so people wouldn't age as quickly. Um, and it would condense, right now our atmosphere about 80, 90 miles high. But if you condense that, um, and it's all underneath that 50 mile mark, then the, uh, the atmosphere is thicker, uh, more oxygen, uh, uh, and less ultraviolet. And then it, there's um, a number of other things I would do. Now, when the flood happened, the theory goes, is maybe an asteroid, because a lot of people, we know we've been hit by asteroids. We have the crater impacts in the Yucatan Peninsula and other places. We know we've been hit by asteroids. Um, and let's say an asteroid comes in, hits that canopy, cracks the canopy, um, fractures it. Now, it doesn't just fall straight down. It actually goes toward the poles. So at the top of the earth and the bottom pole, the, the ice would then collapse in at the poles. And what's very interesting about that is um, a couple things. There, There is a um, big, I remember years ago when Sarah Palin was running for um, vice president, and they are talking about Alaska. There's this, uh, don't forget, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but there's this oil field in northern Alaska huge oil field well that means at one point that was a huge forest a tropical area so that the, wherever you find oil that means there was biological mass in huge proportions so as uh, saudi arabia of course we know that area there's a huge amount of oil there that means at one point that used to be covered in in tropical rainforest or you know very thick forest same thing in northern alaska but something collapsed in or something happened to change the environment of that area. Now it's, it's just ice and, and uh, so forth. Um, so the canopy theory would, uh, could kind of account for that. The ice comes in at the poles and then there's, uh, in, um, 
Russia, they found this herd of woolly mammoths that were buried alive. And this is fascinating because some of the woolly mammoths still had grass in their mouth. Oh, so yeah. that's they had grass in their mouth, they're chewing grass, and they get buried alive with ice, right? So what, what snowstorm would go so quickly right. you couldn't even finish your dinner? I mean, and the ice and the grass itself. So they're chewing grass, and then they're now in the Arctic a afterwards. So it's very interesting. They're quick frozen. I mean, it's it's a it's a very unique <laughs> freeze dry, freeze dry, yeah, yeah, yeah freeze dry. <laughs> and so that's interesting with the the canopy theory and and again, these are interesting theories. And the, the Bible hints at something. I, this is a big belief of mine. The Bible hints at stuff like Michael Heiser that we've talked about. You know, it's, it's weird. It's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. So it hints at things like dinosaurs on the ark. That's another question that comes up. And just real quick is Noah, if he was told to bring dinosaurs on the ark, he wouldn't bring the big old full grown male and adults. He would bring small, maybe even eggs, mm -hmm. incubate some eggs. Then when they get off the ark, uh, the dinosaurs, when they get off, um, they, they would go away from humans. Right. Um, and it's interesting how you see the, the pattern of the, 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 the um, animals when they get off the ark, it's an interesting, I won't go down that, but the more dangerous animals stay closer because they don't have to leave because <laughs> everybody else has to leave. Whereas, uh, Australia gets all the small little dingoes and stuff, <laughs> you know, so they actually, they, they stratify themselves throughout the earth. It's interesting. Let me um, ask you this, post-flood, sure. because that is another question I've had even a lot of my youth group people ask, is, you know, when the animals, they're only two by two, except for those that were for sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, came off the ark, how on earth could just two populate the entire world? Because now we're talking post-Noah, so we're not talking people living thousands, a thousand, almost a thousand years, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking a much shorter lifespan. Could God have just gone ahead and recreated or continued to create some of the different types? Well, like we talk with dogs. I mean, you know, they all kind of come from one dog, but at the same time, how do you go from a the chihuahua, wolf, the wolf to a chihuahua? Just yeah. <laughs> you go from a lion to a tiger to um, what's that? hairless cat <laughs> i don't think that's a dog <laughs> you mean that, that, that's called an abomination is what that's <laughs> called no okay well it, it, speaking of like and I'll, I'll tie this into real quick but like um dinosaurs uh there's thousands of different kinds of dinosaurs but the problem is is and i talked to my students about this if you if you're a paleontologist your claim to fame is coming up with a new dinosaur right so if you find a fossil that looks just like your friend's fossil that he discovered 20 years ago, but you can find one thing different, something different, you can make it a different species. So for instance, my understanding is there are 54 different types of triceratops, right? Now, could, were there 54 different triceratops on the, on the ark, or was it just a pair of triceratops that when they got off the ark, their DNA and the, the way God made them, they adapted to their different environments around the world. And so you end up with um, different kinds of triceratops. You, same thing with dogs. You know, on the ark, there were probably two wolves. And when those wolves get off the ark, um, they reproduce and then uh, some get domesticated, those become dogs. And then, um, you know, the really cool dogs become Australian shepherds and the, the failures. Right. I just have a hard time figuring out how from the gray wolf you can end up with something like the mastiff the saint bernard and a yorkie or a chihuahua <laughs> i mean that's, that's so crazy different you know like okay so we raised we bred and raised and showed miniature horses okay and you get that because you know you have the horse and actually you have the three toed horse if you look back and with the dinosaur era. but uh, they were bred down because they were actually over in england they used them in the mines so they just kept breeding them down smaller, smaller. They were hardier and bigger bones, so they could pull the stuff. That I get because you're a horse looks like a horse, pretty much. You can get bigger bone structure, smaller bone structure, but they all are kind of the same as a horse. The dogs are so, I guess, maybe the same, but not really. It looks like they're so different. We're not talking different colors, you know. Uh, well, that that gets into uh, selective breeding. So, and th this is interesting with Charles Darwin. 
when he was when he proposed um, origin of the species and uh, natural selection, he looked at pigeon breeders and, and and dog breeders and other breeders in England, and he used the, the intelligence uh, that they were selective breeding pigeons mm -hmm. and dogs and different things to get a desired result like the horses you're talking about and he saw that and he's like well nature could do that so he applies to nature intelligence which is um and that's, that's a that's it so but he, uh, he that, so natural selection is based on some sort of intelligence well humans going back to the dogs humans have been working with dogs for them, one of the first animals that we domesticated and we've been selectively picking things and so it, it shows to me just the variety that god has created in mm -hmm. just two wolves how from those two wolves you could get right you know uh, all these different uh, types of dogs um so yeah so it's selective breeding the the so on the arc you probably have two of each but then when they get off the arc you mentioned that the the atmosphere changed and so forth but it didn't change overnight that's the other thing you can see in the genealogies to tear down um, well, man's days would be 120 and that's about when was the last time that we had the average person live to be 120 if you don't count vampires i mean it's like <laughs> <hold on. laughs> that's another episode <laughs> we've always been told the dinosaurs were pre pre-man pre-flood pre all this stuff millions of years old millions of years old but then we're looking that because what we're finding through um through scientific research and, and stuff that's been unearthed that maybe what we always thought about dinosaurs is not true that they maybe existed while man existed mm -hmm. like you said we're maybe on the boat on the ark mm -hmm. and even after and what has happened to them and could that be some of the sightings but the narrative is still there so we we can't question the narrative and that's sad it's sad that um and i think this is what not to preach, but you know, this is what Paul talks about in Romans one. They exchange the truth for a lie. They worship, right. wor worship and serve the creation more than the creator. And once you get your eyes off the creator and you start worshiping the creation, you, you get deceived, you're led away. Wow. That was a lot for just his first part. And, um, this is actually going to be a two parter with, with Philip. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that, um, explore a little farther sure. later on. But after stretching our minds so much and digging in deep to all that, I don't know about you, but I think I need a little break. I think so too. I think it's time for a joy, joy break. break. <laughs> joy. <laughs> bah humbug break is, is what I call it, the bah humbug. <laughs> <laughs> so today I have some little short stories, um, little quips. Um, these say this one. These ones are entitled "Bloopers from the Pulpit," uh -huh. and I thought you might appreciate these today. Uh, so, eager to improve his sermons, a young pastor brought a tape recorder and recorded one of his Sunday morning services. After dinner, he put the cassette in the recorder, boy that dates this joke, um, <laughs> sat on the sofa and listened to the tape. The opening prayer, the scripture readings, and the hymns came forth quite nicely. Then came the sermon. When he awoke, sometime later, the choir was singing the closing hymn. <laughs> yeah, I didn't relate. <laughs> Four or five times, yeah. It's me to sleep. After a worship service, a preacher announced the class on prophecy has been canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I asked a pastor how long he had to retirement. He took a moment to respond and then said, 28 board meetings. <laughs> I, can, I can be sympathetic. To that. <laughs> uh, okay. This is, this is going to be good. A recently arrived immigrant who knew very little English visited a church in High Point, North Carolina one Sunday morning. Because the church was full, the usher put him in the front pew. A tall man was ushered in and sat beside him, so the immigrant decided to do whatever the tall man did. 
When the tall man stood up, the immigrant stood up. When the tall man sat down, he sat down. When the tall man bowed his head, he bowed his head. And, the tall, and when the tall man knelt, he knelt. The immigrant was enjoying the service, but suddenly the church became quiet. The tall man rose to his feet. When the immigrant stood up beside him, the tall man became upset and pushed him back down. The immigrant was perplexed. After the service, the tall man apologized to him for his rude behavior and tried to explain that it was a baptismal service, and the preacher had asked, Will the father of the baby please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> Have not had that happen. <laughs> that would be it. How would you handle that situation? <laughs> Delicately. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know you, the show must go on, so That's you right. handle it. The minister, leading prayers, was being carried away by his own exuberance. He began, O oh thou, who rulest the raging of the sea, and calms the fierceness of the winds. He then seemed to lose himself <laughs> for a moment, but soon carried on. Oh, wow, Kevin okay, <clears throat> o thou who rulest the raging of the sea and calms the fierceness of the winds, he then seemed to lose himself for a moment, but soon carried on. Bless our wives. <laughs> <laughs> there might be some well, raging and fierceness of the winds. What do you do not do for Mother's Day? <laughs> What do you do with that? This is the time where we're actually going to kind of chew on and process what we've just kind of learned. That's right. And talk about why it's important and why we care yeah. and how we can apply it to our life, why it's important for our life. And why we think maybe you might be interested in this as well. That's right. So did you know that Tanin, which means serpent, mm -hmm. is actually in the Bible. It's listed there. Uh, it's in Genesis. It's in three times in Exodus. Mm -hmm. It's in Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. um, dragon is mentioned 13 times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Or Leviathan is mentioned six times. Six times. Two in Job, two in Psalms, and two in Isaiah. And Leviathan is what? It is a big sea monster, a big right. sea creature. In fact, that's what a lot of people think that um, the Loch Ness monster. Monster, monster is part of that. Um, and then the behemoth is yeah. also mentioned. That's mentioned in Job 40. Um, some say it's a hippopotamus, but I'm pretty sure that I'm not the same. Um, it's described as a powerful grass-eating animal whose bones are tubes of bronze and limbs like bars of iron. Well, and then even in some places it talks he has a tail of a cedar. Well, neither hippopotamus or rhinoceros have tails that are anything close to cedar. cedar. But a brontosaurus. <laughs> that would have a tail of a cedar. A tail of cedar. There's even one Jewish legend that says that the righteous will witness a spectacular battle between the behemoth and the leviathan in a messianic era and later feast upon their flesh. Now will be one heck of a barbecue. That's right. <laughs> so the concept of dinosaurs and dragons that Philip talked about being the same for, you know, at least part of it. Part of it, yeah. I mean, when you look at that, if you were to not have the flesh mm -hmm. and you're just looking at the skeletons, I can see there is really not much difference. You know, I loved how you talked about that. What you know, when he started asking us what we thought was the difference. Well, we don't know first of all, and the things that we have conjured up in our mind is because of TV, right. because of stories, because of legends. The knights in shining armor always went out after the dragon. And I always said, where did the concept of the dragon even come from? Makes you know, the scriptures talk about a dragon a lot, but it doesn't give any description right. whatsoever of a dragon. And yet, they all look about the same. They, they have really different colors, they have a little different head, but again, mm -hmm. if you came down to the skeleton, right. they would all look very, very similar. Very much similar. Uh, Chinese is the only one that has the different mm -hmm. type of sort of dragon mm -hmm. serpent. Which I've always thought was very interesting. interesting. It goes right along with when we talked about the little gods, um, who they worship 
Maybe that's what a nakash would have looked like. If you wonder. Yeah. And it is a shiny. It is a shiny. That's one. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, very interesting on some of the different things of the scripture. So that was, um, yeah, very interesting. We have, and then we have the different sizes of dinosaurs, but we don't really know. They've given them all different names, but are they just different ages of the same? Dinosaur, same species. Kind of, yeah, same species. Especially when now that we at least are willing to recognize and admit that the dating of the right. fossils is not nearly as accurate as we once believed. So it's like, well, that would make sense because, like we talked about after the f flood, it's just a really interesting concept, and I like that he pointed out what we know. Right. And, well, and, and what we talked assume. about digging up the different pockets of, of um, bones, mm -hmm. how <sighs> they even put the wrong bones with the wrong fossil skeletons, mm -hmm. so right. then it came up with a whole different right. species that actually wasn't supposed to go there. And right. that, that, I never thought about that, but mm -hmm. I always did wonder how did they know unless you have one that is completely all in case, right. yes, and in order, then you know exactly mm -hmm. what yeah. happened. Well, and even just making us think like they found us, they wouldn't have any idea what we were capable of, you know, a thousand years from now they just found a bunch of our skeletons. They would have no idea what part of the country we came from too much. You could probably tell between a woman and a man, maybe based on the pelvis and that kind of stuff, but they wouldn't know what color we were. Mm -mm. They no. wouldn't know if we were fast runners or not fast runners right. or so long or <laughs> so much, right, is or how smart we were or <clears throat> what we did for a living, they wouldn't have any idea. It's right. like bones. So it's an interesting concept, for sure. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go back and clarify a little bit about the whole dating of the remains. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about the age and the years of, well, you know, going to be millions and millions of years old or, or thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. And I did say that because I had been in radiology, I mean, we took a lot of courses on this. And, oh, sure. And I always have struggled with that because we know that when you're doing radiography that the, the amount of radiation that comes out, if you just step back half you've lessened the amount four times mm -hmm. so if you go back another half you've lessened it eight times so so the amount is getting so minute to the subject so then when you start talking about the radioactive atoms of a specific radionuclide to declare k um, I looked this up but it said a real good, good rule of thumb is that after seven half lives you will have less than one percent of the original amount of radiation so then I looked up the half-life of carbon dating, carbon-14. Mm -hmm. A half-life is 5,730 years, which I don't really know how they come up with that, mm -hmm. but we'll go with it. So if you take seven half-lives, as I said, that's 40,000 years, give or take another 110 years. Mm -hmm. 40,000 is a lot different than millions and billions of years, right. <laughs> and that gets you down to 1%. Right. So how do we know that this dating really is correct? And I've said that from the very beginning. We don't know because nobody was around right. then. Even, even with Noah and Methuselah and Enoch, and I do truly believe that a lot of that stuff was preserved on the ark mm -hmm. that was brought over. But it wasn't actually written down until Moses wrote right. it down. Right. He already wrote down how many thousands of years before we know man came on the earth. Right. So how on earth would we possibly know how many did we know that God created earth and all creation in six days, but <laughs> all we God. have to go by is that a thousand years is but a day to God. So everybody magically latches on to that. Well, right. a day could be a thousand years. Right. I mean, you can do a lot in a thousand years. Right. It could be longer than that. It right. could be 10,000 years. We don't know. It was more of a God worked on six days, rested on the seventh right. day. He that wanted was to set showing us. Show, set the pattern for us. Right. Not that it was a day like we know of, because this is God, so time is relative. Exactly. And it's... Exactly. So, getting back to that then, what does it look like with the dinosaurs that we think, you know, what, when did they actually die? Now, of course, if you were in school like us, right. you learned the evolution theory. I did. I did. As a little bit of evolution, creation, uh, you know, there wasn't really push. There was not an agenda at the time. We learned it all. Mm -hmm. 
but our, I was lucky. My teacher let us ask hard questions. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the big things is what really killed the dinosaurs? Well, we came up with growing up as what an ice age, mm -hmm. and it was the meteorite, like Philip talked. Yeah, yeah. Possibly, <clears throat> and I think something had to happen. I think that's what was still the common mm -hmm. thought when I was in school. Also, just along with evolution and then some big cataclysmic event that, that caused them to all become extinct at once. Okay, so there had to become an event. And it's really interesting when you look at the oxygen bubbles. Mm -hmm. Then how do we know the oxygen content? Because of amber. And amber is just fossilized oh, tree sap. Right. Which is really cool because I actually have some and I have some things fossilized in it that um, I use with my healing ministry. But, but so we can actually look at that mm -hmm. and see the oxygen content to get an idea pre-event, mm -hmm. post-event. What was your concept of the ice dome theory? When you very first heard that, I mean, we, he talked about it last night, but we had talked with Philip about this before. A few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it was, compl it was absolutely outside of anything I'd ever heard before, but it, to me, I guess it had some, has merit to it at least was interesting to think about um, because, and honestly, this all of this the last few weeks talking about like the change in the climate that would have happened because of the flood and, and I just hadn't, I hadn't chewed on a lot of that before. Um, so this has been interesting and fascinating even just along with a long food process. But I, I the idea of some something cataclysmic, because what would cause an ice age? I mean, the, there was that was the struggle like they couldn't figure out well all of a sudden it just got it just changed yeah because if you go with some of the trains of thought of that well because there was this complete ice age that would have killed everything off well then everything would have ceased to exist and right. then but yet here we still are right so that somehow is, i really really um was excited about this one possibility because it does make sense mm -hmm. that coming through if there was this ice dome mm -hmm. Like he said, the magnetic fields would have pulled it to the poles, and that's how we ended up with the two poles north and south with all the south. ice. And how it would explain, how do you have an entire herd of something, we've seen this in multiple places up there, that were literally eating and then just, boom, smashed. Right. I mean, they were covered in ice and they were frozen in time. And didn't even have a chance to swallow. I mean, yeah, they, uh, they were still eating. Yeah. And, and there was vegetation. You, Right, because there isn't vegetation like that up there now. And how does that work if it was the whole well? Because the, the asteroid came through and it changed the climate and everything then got cold. That, that would have been happen. gradual. When right. it happened exactly, something had to happen to cover everything in ice and freeze dry it, basically. Oh, yeah. When you think of dinosaurs, too, they would everything about them was smaller respiratory. Right. I mean, smaller nostrils, smaller everything, and probably higher elevation. So they had to be able to breathe easier, but then also the vegetation needed that. I mean, they were producing a lot of O2 because there was a lot there, and they needed the dinosaurs to give off a lot of CO2. Right. For that cycle to continue. Right. So and after the flood, there wasn't yes. nearly as much vegetation that for them to, one, eat, and no, two, was there gone. wasn't the, the f trees to continue to produce oxygen, it makes sense that that could explain this event that changed things so drastically. Right. So what was your thought process of the first time you've heard, and actually with Philip talking about it, it's not the first time I've heard that um, uh, Noah would have taken dinosaurs on the ark. In fact, I think even at Kentucky at the ark, mm -hmm. they have, have yes, the, the scientists and doctors there have said, that it was po very possible, probably more probable mm -hmm. than not. Uh, well, it makes sense if they, if he would have taken like babies or even eggs, something that in a forty day, you know, flood, and were, then and then around the ark for six months. Right, that's what I'm saying. The forty day flood, and then the ensuing months of mm -hmm. drying out. Um, yeah. Well, we don't know how long it takes for a dinosaur to hatch. We, That's true. We know an elephant takes two years, so how long could it have been for offspring from a dinosaur? But that's not an egg. Well, not all of them were eggs. Well, that's true. 
But we don't even know that, I guess, do we? No, we don't know. We just assume because they're, they're all reptiles. They're not all. Well, yeah. yeah I, I would imagine they would. You have the woolly mammoths. And they were not. Yeah. They were mammalian. Just very. Just so much interesting Thanks food to for thought about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if they, if Noah would have brought over some of the dinosaurs, and like he said with the Triceratops, you know, there's 50 different kinds that they found, or at least what they classify them as, but they all stem from the two. Mm -hmm. Just like dogs all came from Great Wolf, mm -hmm. so to speak. I, you know, and, and we all kind of have our theories about that too, about afterwards, after the flood, if God continued to create right. and help repopulate the earth. Repopulate than just from the two of everything mm -hmm. that started out. But I do think it's, it, is interesting to, I guess, take that um, information and apply it or think of it, you know, for me, like I learned about evolution and some of the science from it made sense from an adaptive standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was always able to, I guess, somewhat reconcile my faith with what I was learning was that you know, it makes sense that if they ended up having to go somewhere where it was colder, that they would develop thicker skin and more fur and, and some of that kind of stuff. Um, and that God couldn't have built that into the design, that they were able to adapt. Because we're able to adapt, you know. Um, but that doesn't, like, believing in that or recognizing that that is good science doesn't take away from the creation. It doesn't take away from the fact that a lot of the rest of what was talked about which we'll look at next week um, right. was so if the dinosaurs came off the boat mm -hmm. you know things would have changed because oh, yeah. the oxygen content was going to be different mm -hmm. and they would have to adapt mm -hmm. and they would have to migrate differently right to find more vegetation or more whatever like that. so well I think for this week mm -hmm. that's kind of what we want to do is just wrap this up a little bit since this is going to be a two-parter right um, with Phil, we're, we're just really wanting to dive in more with the whole what do you do with when we've been told stuff over and over that we just kind of maybe blindly took as okay. truth, but is it really? Right. I mean, do we really know? And What sources are good to trust? Exactly. Exactly. Because sometimes the sources that we assume are good to trust might not always be. Might not always be. And we've heard that people say, well, dinosaurs aren't mentioned in the Bible, so it had to have been pre-all this. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. Because if the term hadn't even been coined until the 1840s, you wouldn't find it in the Bible. No, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's just a lot of, there's a lot more scientific evidence. And that's one of the things we talked about. I think Philip even mentioned it in Israel. The more we uncover, especially over there, it just continues to confirm what the Bible says. Right. It doesn't um, contradict it. Right. It's which is... It's kind of exciting to be around during a time when God is allowing all of this to be the other. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I've always said with <laughs> evolution, I didn't find, well, I don't believe in the we came from apes, but, but like the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, okay, maybe God chose, that's how he right. made, made everything. Because he could go, and it could be done. <laughs> but you know what I always loved was then I would always come back on them and say, okay, you say everything started from a bunch of dust that exploded. What I want to know is, where did the, the dust, dust come from? from? That's right. <laughs> now one person has been able to... Questions that we choose not to answer right. because they don't match our agenda or our thing. Right. Yeah. Well, we know where it came from. We, we know do. how the whole creation thing transpired, even if we don't know the nuts and bolts of it. Right. And we don't know the exact time frame. The thing is, we serve a God that is so big that nothing is impossible. No. No. From, from the dinosaurs to dragons, humans, dragons <laughs> to the flood to where we are today. That's and right. actually what we're going to look at next, next week. week. That is going to be so exciting. It is. You're not going to want to miss this because we're going to have the evidence of stuff that's going to blow your mind. Did mine? Yeah, and make you think even more outside of the box. That's right. So until next time, we, we encourage you to get, get used to different and ask you, how are you living life in the spirit? Bye. Bye.